يا أيها العالم المطي سيراته أبشر فأنت بغير الماء ريان ويا أخ الجهل لو أصبحت في لوجج فأنت ما بينها لشك ضمآن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I would like to thank the masjid for calling me down and also Ustad Abu Salama for facilitating this. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that whoever does not thank the people, then he has not thanked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And secondly, before we begin, uh, those of my students that know how we do the lessons, inshallah at the end of the lesson, I'm going to test you on what we have taken during this lesson. Uh, because it's not enough just to listen to something and for it to go through one ear and come out the other but why do we sit in these type of lessons lectures so we can benefit and that we can retain that knowledge and then act upon um, that knowledge as the prophet وسلم, said in sahih muslim the quran is a proof for you or against you so either it will come on the judgment and it will say oh allah this person knew what was inside of me he knew the meanings he left he listened to lectures <coughs> He had reminders sent to him on WhatsApp or whatever the case may be. And he acted upon me. So it's a proof for you. Or it will come on a day of judgment and say, He knew all of this, but he didn't act upon me. He migrated from me. He neglected me. He abandoned me. So the Quran becomes a proof against a person. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Quran a proof for us and not against us. Um, today's lecture, as titled, it is titled, من المحبرة إلى المقبرة from the cradle to the grave and we'll talk about this uh, statement in a short while but this lecture will comprise of three main topics inshallah mm -hmm. the first is regarding the virtues of knowledge the second is the path of knowledge and the third the objective of knowledge so these three things inshallah the virtues of knowledge the path of knowledge and finally the objective of knowledge. The main part of the lecture will be the first, the virtues of knowledge. And as for the last two points, we'll just quickly move uh, over the last two points and just quickly touch upon them, inshallah. So, as for the first part of the lecture, which is regarding the virtues of knowledge, then I don't think it is something hidden from any of us the high status that knowledge has in the religion of Islam. And to further show and clarify this point, we will insha'Allah mention a few ayat from the Qur'an and then some ahadith and then some statements of some of the ulama and then we'll finish off with maybe some stories and incidents from some of the ulama of the Salaf. So we'll start off from with some of the ayat in the Qur'an and we'll start off with the first ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down which was, who knows what's the first ayah? Uh, all of you know. Iqra. Naam. Read the first word sent down to the Prophet وسلم, even though the Prophet وسلم, himself didn't know how to read or write was Iqra, read. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have sent down anything. Could it be something directly you know, with Tawheed, could it be something to do with fiqh, could it be something to do with something else? But the first word revealed to the Prophet وسلم, was Iqra, read. That shows to us that Islam is not a religion of blind following it's not a religion of laziness it's not a religion of just following one desires and doing what he thinks is right but rather islam is a nation of knowledge a nation that reads a nation that whenever any matter and any issue arises arises they look into knowledge they look into what the quran says what the sunnah of the prophet ﷺ mentions and what the ulama have said regarding this and if the first word being revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, being a command, read, or Muhammad ﷺ, read, if that wasn't enough, later on the Prophet ﷺ received another command in a different ayah. And this time, in this ayah, in Surah Taha, is a command to make a dua. And to make a dua, you know, many times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make a dua for this, make a dua for this, and so on. 
But to, this is the first time in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He commands the Prophet sallallahu to make a dua for an increase in something As for an increase, as for more Not just as for this thing but as for an increase And that is the famous dua وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا and say, i.e. Allah SWT is saying to the Prophet, make this dua, Rabbi zidani ilma. Oh my Lord, increase me in my knowledge. And this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one that who said, Ana a'lamukum billah. I am the most knowledgeable of all of you regarding Allah. So if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being commanded to make a dua for an increase in knowledge, what about you and I, who barely know the basics of our religion? The Prophet has been commanded to ask for an increase in knowledge. Another ayah that we can mention, and now we can go into a bit of tafsir. You know, when you do tafsir, there's different ways of doing tafsir. The first step that the ulama normally mention of doing tafsir is called tafsir al Quran bil Quran. That you explain the Quran with another verse in the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is speaking. So He is the one. Who is most knowledgeable regarding what he intends by what he has said? So, you know, an example can be Surah Fatiha, for example. When we say, Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path, Idina Salat al Mustaqim, Salat al Ladina and Amta Alihim, guide us to that path, the path of those whom you have bestowed your favor upon. Who are these people Allah has bestowed his favor upon? In another ayah, Allah says, Faulaka ma'al Ladina and Naam Allah. That those people who have uh, that Allah has bestowed His favor upon are the prophets uh, and the truthful and the martyrs and the pious people. So this ayah in Surah Fatiha is referring to these four types of people, and uh, more included. But generally, who can we say these four types of people are? The prophets, the martyrs, the pious, and the truthful. Why? How, what's your? What's my proof for this? This other ayah in the Quran. So in regards to knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in Surah Fatir إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء That those who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They are the ulama They are those people that have ilm Those, those people that have, that have knowledge If a person claims to have fear of Allah Then he doesn't know anything about Allah Then that claim of his is uh, either a lie or it is deficient Because, the Prophet, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Only those إِنَّمَا That have the, the true fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are those who know Allah they know how great Allah is they know what he is capable of and they acknowledge and they understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has created them and he is the one that will take their life and he is the one who they will be standing in front of on a day of judgment and he is the one who will decide whether they are going to paradise or they are going to the hellfire in surah Bayyinah a surah which I think most of us, inshallah, have memorized. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَةِ That those that believe in Allah and have knowledge regarding Allah and they do righteous deeds, they are the best of people. They are the best of people. And then, a few ayat later, to the end of the surah, right at the end, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the reward, that these people who are the best of people, they will gain jannah, and they will have trees where rivers are flowing beneath them and so on and they will be in there forever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says ذَلِكَ that reward that we have mentioned لِمَنْ خَشْيَ رَبَّهِ are for those who have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in Surah Fatir Allah mentions that those that truly fear Allah they are those that have knowledge and in Surah Bayyina we learn that the best of people are those that fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala If you put these together, these ayat you put together You learn that the ulama Or those that have knowledge They are the ones who fear Allah And if you look at Surah Bayyina Those that fear Allah They are the best of people So though the ulama, those that have knowledge They fear Allah And those that have khashya, that true fear of Allah They are the best of people We come to the conclusion that the ulama are the best of people. Somebody will ask you, who are the best of people? They are those that have knowledge. And not any knowledge, beneficial knowledge. You know, those that have knowledge, understand it and act upon it, which is based on the Quran and Sunnah and so on. But in, in summary, the best of people are the ulama. Because Allah says, the ulama are those that fear Allah, and those that fear Allah are the best of people. 
Hence, from the virtues of knowledge that we can take from this ayat, is that this knowledge makes you the best of, from the best of people. Not anything else, not wealth, fame, status, being eloquent in speech. Like, it is knowledge. A person truly uh, understands the Quran and the Sunnah upon understanding of the Salaf from the Sahaba and their students. That, that is uh, true knowledge and which leads them to acting upon that knowledge. Those are the people who are the best of people. So these are just some of the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran regarding, uh, regarding knowledge. What about some hadith? Again, the hadith are many. And the objective of this lecture is not to mention every single the ayah, every single hadith. By the way, there is a book, and I brought it with me in case anyone does want to look at it. Um, from the best places where you can find the virtues of knowledge is this book over here called Miftah Dar al Sa'adah. Uh, which I don't know if it's translated, but if it is, then it's something along the lines of the key to the abode of happiness, written by Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah. And uh, it's a three volume book, but the first volume from it, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions so many benefits, I think over 150 uh, virtues of, of knowledge. And even the ayat he mentions, he mentions many uh, different ways how that one ayah, and he goes into depth. For example, we have Shahid Allah anna hu la ilaha illahu, the ayah. Uh, he mentions 10 different ways that ayah shows the virtues of knowledge and so on. So anybody who wants more uh, information uh, regarding the virtues of knowledge, then you can go back to this book here and I'll have it with me if anyone wants to take a picture or anything uh, like that later, inshallah. But we'll move on to uh, some ahadith. And again, the ahadith are, are many. From them is a the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whoever treads upon a path of seeking knowledge, Allah will make his path to Jannah easy for him. Put your hand up if you want to go to Jannah. Okay, making sure everyone wants to go to Jannah. You want to go to Jannah? Put your hand up. Alhamdulillah. May Allah make us run people of Jannah. Amen. And put your hand up if you want to go to Jannah. If you want to take the hard path to Jannah. Put your hand up. The hard path. You want to take the hard path or the easy path? Uh, I changed. I changed the open. <laughs> right. Of course, everyone wants to take the easy path to Jannah. The most of Prophet sallallahu is saying this hadith in Muslim. Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilma sahal Allah lahu bihi tariqan il Jannah. Whoever treads upon the path of seeking knowledge, learning about his religion, learning about Allah and His Messenger, sahal Allah lahu bihi tariqan il Jannah. Allah will make his path to Jannah easy for him. You want the easy path to Jannah? Learn what Allah said in the Quran. Learn what the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned. Learn about your religion. Learn, if you learn about your religion, you understand your religion, you act upon that knowledge, that's the easy path to go to paradise. In another hadith, famous hadith of uh, Abu Darda, a very, very famous hadith uh, regarding seeking knowledge. Ibn Rajab actually has a book where he explains this hadith, and I've gone through it on my, on my channel if anyone wants to go through it. But it's a long hadith. He starts off with the same statement. Uh, where the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever treads upon the path of seeking knowledge, Allah will make his path to Jannah easy for him. And in the same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ carries on. And he says, وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And very the angels, they lower their wings, رِضًا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ Out of pleasure of what the student of knowledge is doing. The angels are lowering their wings. And then the ulama differ exactly what does that mean. But the fact that, that it's got something to do with the angels, that even the angels, uh, lowering their wings, whether it's out of humility or whatever the case may be, for a student of knowledge. And then, Prophet ﷺ carries on, وَإِنَّ الْعَالِمْ لَا يَسْتَغْفِرُ لَهُ كُلُّ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ That the person who has knowledge, everything in this world, and uh, on this earth and in the heavens, they do istighfar for the student of knowledge. The one who is learning, everything is making dua for that person. And asking, or, uh, asking Allah to forgive that person for his sins. Even the whale and the fish in the sea, they are also making dua for the one who has gone out of his way to learn about the religion. And then the Prophet ﷺ carries on. The virtue, or verily the virtue of the one who has knowledge over the one who worships Allah. So here we have two people. We have one person who, who knows the religion. He has knowledge about Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we have another person who worships Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He's always praying Salah, he's always reciting Quran. He's, he's a person of worship. 
Yeah, both of these are good characteristics, right? One person knows the religion, the other is worshipping Allah. But what does the Prophet وسلم, say in this hadith? That a virtue of the scholar, the one who knows over the one who worships Allah. So from this statement, we learn that who is better? The one who knows the religion, he has more virtue over the one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, how much virtue? How much is he better? said, Just like the virtue of, of the moon over the rest of the stars. The moon, you can clearly see the moon. The moon is beautiful. And then if you want to go into science as well, they mention how the moon benefits in terms of, you know, if it was closer or further, then it will have waves and so on. Uh, the moon is also, you know, gives us some light and so on. All of these benefits of the moon. And then the stars, not the same benefit, not the same virtue like the moon. So just like the moon is superior to all of the other stars, likewise the scholar is to the one who is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7. And if that is the worshipper, then what about the rest of the people? And then in the same hadith, we're still on the same hadith, the Prophet sallallahu carries on and he says, وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ That the scholars, they are the inheritors of the Prophets. وَإِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِثُ دِينَ رَمَ وَلَا دِرْهَمَا وَإِنَّمَا وَرَثُ الْعِلْمِ And the Prophets, they didn't leave behind uh, money, whether it's dinar, dirham, pounds, pennies, whatever it may be. They didn't leave uh, behind wealth. وَإِنَّمَا وَرَثُ الْعِلْمِ They left behind ilm, knowledge. فَمَنْ أَخَذَا أَخَذَ بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ Whoever takes from it, then he has taken a good portion. And I remember, uh, I can't which scholar it was, but it's mentioned on some of the scholars. Uh, I think of some of the Sahaba actually and it's something that happened to me as well uh, last year I went for Umrah and you know during Covid uh, you know, they were very strict in uh, being together uh, and social distancing and everything so I went with a group uh, I think many of you might know we went with uh, some of the brothers and uh, I was able to go to the, the, the office of the Mutun and Alhamdulillah because you know, I know Shaykh Qasim and some of the others I was able to get everyone uh, free copies of all of the mutun. So when I got, gathered all of them, uh, I had a few bags, and I went outside where all the brothers were waiting for me, and I start. I told them to come, and I started giving them out the books I was able to get. One of the policemen, he saw me, and he told us to, you know, social distancing move. You can't be like that. And then when he came closer, he saw the books. He said, he started smiling, and he said, "I thought you were giving out money, you know, just because of the way they were crowding around you." I thought, they were, I thought you were giving out money. So I said to him, you know, there's something better than, better than money. This is the inheritance, inheritance of the prophets. And then he smiled and he realized uh, the status of what we were giving out. And he made dua and you know, he, he moved on. The point being is that this knowledge is not something normal. And it's not something which is lowly. It's not something which is cheap. This is the inheritance of the prophets. You know, people fight, have family issues over this land and this land. All of that is trivial compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and what the Prophet has said. And all of these virtues that I just mentioned is one hadith known as the hadith of uh, Abu Darda uh, radiallahu anhu. Another hadith is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi where he says, Man yuridillahu bihi khayran yufaqihum fi deen. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, he will give him the understanding of the religion. So a sign that Allah wants good for you is that he allows you to understand what is in the Quran and what is in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani uh, Rahimahullah comments on this ayah in Futh al-Bari and he says that this hadith has an opposite understanding just as if Allah wants good for you he will give you understanding of the religion likewise if Allah doesn't want good for you he will not give you the understanding of the religion so you have to contemplate and ponder over yourself do I actually know my religion? do I know the rulings of Salah? Uh, pillars of salah, conditions of salah, what are they? If something happens in salah, what do I do? You know, some people think that any mistake that happens is to do the sahu. No, that's not the case. In certain scenarios, yeah, I mean, in certain scenarios, no. Sometimes your salah is uh, not accepted at all. And uh, Ibn Hajar, he, when he continues to explain this, he mentions another narration. Uh, even though he mentions that it's weak, but the, the meaning is there, which is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want good for you, then he will not care about that person. Let, let me bali me. You, you, you won't care about this person. You won't take care of this person. So we have to we have to think: that Are we from those that Allah wants good for? Or are we from those that Allah He doesn't care about? 
And how do we know that? By looking how much knowledge do we have regarding the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is in the Quran and what is in the Sunnah of the Prophet So these are just some of uh, the ahadith. As for some of the aqwal of the ulama, some of the statements of uh, the scholars, again there are many. You know, Ali radiallahu an has a very nice statement, a very logical statement, which is quite, quite profound if a person thinks about it. He says, كَفَى بِالْعِلْمِ ثَنَاءً وَمَدْحًا Something like that. He says, enough for to show the praise and the high status of knowledge is أَنْ يَدَّعِيَهُ كُلُّ مَنْ لَا يُحْسِنُ That every person who doesn't have it, he claims to have it. You know, people don't know an issue, they claim, no, no, actually I know. And they want to talk about this issue and so on. Right? So he says, enough to show the high status of, of knowledge is that every person who doesn't have knowledge, he claims to have knowledge. وَكَفَى بِالْجَهْلِ ذَمَّنْ أَنْ يَتَبَرَّأْ كُلُّ مَنْ هُوَ فِيهِ And enough to show how bad and how lowly and how dispraiseworthy ignorance is, is that everybody who is ignorant, he claims to be free from ignorance. You say to somebody, you're ignorant regarding this issue, he'll get offended, even though he might be. But he'll get offended, why you call me ignorant for, and then you know, he'll probably end up saying other things as well. Imam al-Shafi'i, he says uh, that the best actions after the obligatory is Talib al ilm That the best action that a person can do after seeking knowledge, uh, 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 the best thing a person, uh, best action a person can do after the obligatory actions is seeking knowledge. So the most important things in the religion is that which is obligatory, your salah, your obligations, being good to your parents and so on. After the obligations, what is it? It is learning about the religion. And that's why uh, Imam al-Nawi in the beginning of his majmu' he, uh, he says اتفق جماعة السلف على أن الاشتغال بالعلم أفضل من اشتغال بنوافل الصلاة والصوم وتسبيح وغيرها من أعمال البدن He says that groups of the salaf not one or two people but groups of the salaf have all agreed that busying yourself with knowledge is better than busying yourself with the nawafil salawat and uh, the recommended and extra uh, uh, fasts and tasbih that a person does. So that shows that even uh, when it comes to nawafil of salah and uh, fasting, when you compare it to learning about the religion, then there's no comparison. Because that knowledge, it allows you to do those actions in the correct manner. And it also allows you to rectify uh, the actions of others and also guide others to uh, the straight path. All of these ayat, ahadith and aqwal that we have me- mentioned, you know, if you were to evaluate all of them, then you understand a hadith that Prophet ﷺ narrated in Ibn Majah and authenticated by Al-Albani, where th- he says that the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ says, طالب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم That seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. No, it's not a condition, we're not talking about becoming a scholar generally. But at least the basics of the religion. You know, what are the conditions of salah, pillars of salah, wudu, um, what are your, the, the, the basics of your beliefs, and making sure that you're not falling into shirk, which is the greatest sin. And all the istinja, istijmar. Now sometimes people get excited, want to talk about the big issues, what are the conditions of istijmar, they don't know what it is, they don't know how to go to the bathroom. You know, these basics, you know, these are obligatory for us to know. And Imam Ahmed was asked that what type of knowledge is obligatory? And he said, ما يقوم به دينة. That knowledge which allows you to keep your religion upright. Uh, and, then he gave, and then he said, uh, and he gave some examples from your salah and your fasting and so on. Uh, those things that you need on a day-to-day basis, you need to know the rulings pertaining to that. Whether it's your worship, salah, uh, fasting and so on. Whether it's your transactions, your business. You don't need to know all of Islamic finance but at least you need to know what is halal and haram in your business so that you, you don't fall into it. And if you look at how the ulama were and how the salaf were, when it came to seeking knowledge, you understand that they truly comprehended, comprehended the status of ilm, the status of knowledge in Islam. And you'll find that, I'm going to start off with, a, I'm going to ask you a question. Those people, I mentioned this last week in our hadith lesson, so you guys can't answer. Who was the first person to travel to seek, for, to seek knowledge? Musa. Huh? Musa alayhi salam. Very good. Ahsant. So even before Islam, Musa alayhi salam, from Ulul Azam, from the greatest of prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to go and learn from Khidr alayhi salam. And likewise, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
one could argue even maybe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveled when he went to Isra al Mi'raj. And in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Malik Muhawari, he's mentioned that he came with some of the youngsters and stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 20 days to learn and then they went back. And even the Sahaba themselves, Jabir radiallahu an, traveled from Medina to Mecca, which would have been at least a month. Just why? For one hadith. Shu'ba, uh, rahimahullah. Uh, uh, this is mentioned by Khatib al-Baghdadi in his book uh, Rihla fi Talib al-Hadith A very good book as well Which I forgot to bring today uh, which, is, which is translated into English Titled Traveling and the Pursuit of Knowledge Where he mentions many uh, stories of how the ulama used to travel He mentions the story of Shu'ba Where Shu'ba was at home And there were some students outside of his house Revising knowledge And they mentioned a hadith And this hadith once Shu'ba heard it, he came out and he slapped one of them, the, the one who was narrating his hadith. And then he just went back inside. Came out later and he saw this person's crying. So he said to him, why are you crying? And he said, قَدْ أَسَتْ That you, uh, you, you know, you, you hurt him. And he said, I only did that because of what you were narrating. And he mentions that this hadith that you were narrating, and we're from Kufa, it was mentioned by somebody who was in Mecca. So I traveled from Kufa all the way to Mecca which would have taken a couple of months and then when I went to Mecca I found that person and I asked him regarding the chain and he said he heard it from a person who was living in Medina so he traveled from Mecca to Medina and he found that person and he asked him regarding the chain and narration and he said I heard it from a person who is in Basra which is the other side of Iraq and now he's confused those that know hadith know that a chain and narration isn't known from different places out of the four or five people in the chain is normally from, normally from two places like the first half from Mecca and the second half from Medina or the first half from Basra and the second half is from this place <laughs> normally it's like that because obviously you know it wasn't like whatsapp messages where you can text the person you have to travel alright but he thought Khair, maybe it's possible you know it's not impossible so he went all the way to Basra and he found the person in Basra and he asked him for the chain of narration and when he found the chain of narration and he, he mentioned the people he realized that this hadith is fabricated or is weak and uh, this hadith cannot be accepted. And he said, if this hadith was, was authentic, it would have been more beloved to me than anything else in this world. So you can see Shu'ba radiallahu uh, Shu'ba rahimahullah from the greatest of muhaddithin. He traveled all of this, don't know how many months that would have taken. Why? Not just to learn a hadith. Even for us to say to learn one hadith, you know, that would be something amazing. It wasn't even to learn a hadith, it was to authenticate a hadith that he had already heard. Just to authenticate a hadith. I don't think that these ulama, they got to that level just by a few years of hard work. Like, it was throughout their whole life. Even when they were in old age. Ibn Aqeel, rahimahullah, he says, I am more eager to learn now and I'm in my 70s than I was when I was in my 20s. That's what Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he learned the qiraat. You know, different modes of recitation. He learned that in his 80s, he said. In his 80s, he learned the different qiraat. And then when the scholars were on their deathbeds, Ibn Malik, rahimahullah, who has written the thousand line poetry in, in Arabic, they say that he memorized five lines of poetry on his deathbed. On his deathbed, he memorized five lines of poetry. Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah, it's mentioned that he was on his deathbed and somebody mentioned some, some sort of knowledge. So whilst he's on his deathbed, he asked for a pen and paper to write down what he had heard. So somebody asked him, Afi hadi al-hala, that in this state, you're still worried about writing? And then he mentioned something along the lines that it is not befitting for any person to leave off any knowledge ever whenever he hears it. Because they acknowledge the status of seeking knowledge and learning about the religion and that it is a worship. It means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a, it's a lifelong endeavor. And it's not about age. Yes, the quicker and the earlier, the younger you can start, the better. But don't think just because you're old you can't learn. Bukhari mentions that the companions of the Prophet learn when they were old in age. So that is not something we should prevent a person from seeking knowledge. And that's why Imam Ahmad, when Imam Ahmad was asked 
for how long will you seek knowledge? Imam Muhammad who memorized million hadith. How long are you going to learn for? How long are you going to be memorizing hadith? And then he gave the answer, min al mahbarah ila al maqbarah, from the ink pot to the grave. As soon as I'm able to write, that's when, that's when I started, and until my death, until I reach my grave, I'll be learning. And that's similar to the other famous statement, from the cradle to the grave. So that's where we got this statement from. The statement of Imam Ahmed, min al mahbarah ila al maqbarah, to show that seeking knowledge is not something which is done for a period of time. Uh, it's not something where you do for a small while and you think, okay, I've made it, it's enough. La. Or you think that I'm, pa- I'm past that age. No. It's something which should be with a person throughout his whole life. It should be a lifelong uh, endeavor. So this is the main th- uh, points which I wanted to mention uh, in this lecture. And this is the first part of the lecture which is regarding the virtues of knowledge. And the objective here was to show the importance of knowledge in the life of a Muslim and that it's not something that they should leave to their side but rather a person should have an active plan in learning the religion Alhamdulillah you have you know Shaykh Abu Salama and Shaykh Abdul Salam uh, we should use this opportunity to learn from them so this is the first part of the lecture which is regarding the virtues of knowledge the second part and the, the second and third like I said just quickly going to touch upon it not make it too long the second part was regarding the, the path of knowledge that we've <coughs> After the first part, which is the virtue of knowledge, inshallah, I should have maybe motivated a person to learn. The question now is, how do I learn? Now this, I'm not going to go into, but this, all I wanted to mention is that it's very important that a person acknowledges that anywhere he wants to go, there's always a path. You want, just today I came from Oldham, you know, I had to put it in the Satnav on Google Maps. It told me the path, it told me Surat al Mustaqim, it told me the straight path how to get to, uh, to the Masjid. If I just went out, thinking, oh, you know, this looks right and this looks right, then either I would have reached here on time or I would have just, you know, been really late. So likewise, when it comes to seeking knowledge, there's a path. And who are you going to ask? You're going to ask those people that know that path. In this case, the ulama. So ulama have written books on how to learn. What is the correct methodology of learning? Learning is not just listening to the lecture and forgetting it and moving on. No, it's through writing. It's not just any time you hear a lesson, you jump to this lesson, j- jump to that lesson. Or you go to the sheikh and you jump to that sheikh. That's not seeking knowledge. There's a path, there's a methodology. So uh, it's very important for a student of knowledge not to be hasty and just jump around, but to stick to get uh, to find a teacher and to stick with that teacher and maybe go through books like Ta'zim al Ilm, the glorification of knowledge, or Hilya al Talib al Ilm, the adornment or the etiquettes of a student of knowledge, where it teaches you how to actually seek knowledge, what's the correct way. And uh, if it's difficult for you to find, maybe go through these books then, at least find a teacher and always ask the uh, advice. So that was regarding the second point. And the last point of this lecture, which is regarding the objective of knowledge. You know, you're eager to learn, you've worked out fast to learn, but what is the end goal? What is the objective of knowledge? Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says, لَيْسَ الْعِلْمِ بِكَثْرَةِ الْرِوَايَةِ وَلَكِنَّ الْعِلْمِ الْخَشِيَةِ Knowledge is not narrating many narrations. That's not knowledge. وَلَكِنَّ الْعِلْمِ الْخَشِيَةِ Knowledge is having that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas memorizing a hadith and narrating and so on, that's a means for you to get to the objective, which is getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned the ayat, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Those that truly fear Allah, they are the ulama. So this knowledge that we learn, it shouldn't just be for the sake of narrating or arguing or debating, but is to better yourself and to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you learn about Allah, then Aqeedah ilan Tawheed, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah says, Man araf Allah bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi wa af'alihi ahabbahu la mahalah. Whoever knows Allah with his names and attributes and actions, he will love Allah and there is no doubt in that. So you should ask yourself, I've learned this. Has this, I've learned about Allah, I've learned Tawheed, has that placed the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my heart? Other ulama have said, Man kana lillahi a'raf, kana minhu akhwaf, wa li'ibadatihi aslab, wa an ma'asiyatihi abad. Whoever has more knowledge of Allah, he has more fear of Allah. And he is further away from the disobedience of Allah, and he is more eager to worship Allah. We should ask ourselves, when we learn about Allah, do we have that fear of Allah? Are we far from the disobedience of Allah? 
Are we eager to worship Allah? Are we in the first saf or are we always in the last saf where we have missed uh, raka'at? Do we have a daily portion of the Quran that we recite? Are we falling into backbiting and this and all these other sins? If so, then there's a deficiency. Either in the knowledge that we have learned or in the manner that we have learned it, but there's a deficiency somewhere. And that's why Hamdun al Qassar, rahimahullah, when he was asked, Ma bal al salaf, uh, kalam al salaf, anfa'. Why is it that the speech of the salaf is more beneficial? You know, they spoke less, we speak more, but their speech is so much beneficial than our speech. And he said, لِأَنَّهُمْ تَكَلَّمُوا لِعِزَّةِ الْإِسْلَامِ Because when they spoke, they spoke for the honor of Islam. وَنَجَاتِ النُّفُوسِ And to, for salvation of, uh, of the souls, i.e. from hellfire, to save ourselves from the hellfire. وَرِضَ الرَّحْمَانِ And to gain the pleasure of the Most Merciful, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَنَحْنُ نَتَكَلَّمْ But we speak لِعِزَّةِ النَّفْسِ for the, the, the honor of ourselves. وَقَبُولِ الْخَلْقِ And for the people to accept us. وَطَالِبِ الدُّنْيَا And for us to maybe gain some benefit from this dunya. Ibn Rajib, rahimahullah, one time he was in a lesson. Just like maybe having a lesson right now. And there was a certain issue that was mentioned. And he went into that issue and mentioned every single detail that you can think about regarding that issue. Later on, he had a gathering with some of the umara, some of the kings and princes and the elite from society. And he went with some of his students. And as they were talking, the same issue that he had just explained in class, the same issue came about. However, Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he remained quiet, he didn't speak. So after the gathering, the ulama mentioned, uh, sorry, the, his students, they Asked Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, that in class you mentioned so much detail, you could have just mentioned it. wasn't like it was a year or two, you know, it was years ago that you had forgotten and you had to look over your notes. You just mentioned it. You could have easily just mentioned all that detail in, uh, in that gathering. Why didn't you? And he said, Because when I spoke in our gathering, in our class, that was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when, if I had spoken there, that would have just been for me to show my knowledge. That wouldn't have been for Allah, it would have been for this dunya. So this sincerity, this acknowledgement of this knowledge being a means of them getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not just for the sake of uh, just speaking and showing off that you have knowledge and so on. This is what made the ulama reach this high status. That's why Imam Ahmad, when sincerity is mentioned to him, he said, بِهَذَا اِرْتَفَعَ الْقَوْمِ It was this sincerity. That raised these uh, these people. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant us beneficial knowledge of the religion, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to allow us to take the correct path when it comes to learning about His religion. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to allow us to acknowledge the objective of knowledge and to attain uh, the uh, objective. Subhanakallahu alhamdulillah. Shadu Allah ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, we'll take five minutes of questions, inshallah. Khlas, there's no questions, so. Uh. Yeah. How does a student of knowledge who is starting that journey, how does he differentiate between <coughs> knowledge that is beneficial and knowledge that is maybe not beneficial? Uh, good question. How does a person, a beginner, differentiate between that which is beneficial and that which is beneficial? You go to your teacher. Yeah, you have a teacher. A student of knowledge, not, he's not going to know. He's not going to know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. So you go to your teacher. You find a teacher who is knowledgeable. So he has ahliya. He's knowledgeable. And he's nasih. Somebody who knows how to teach. Uh, knows the correct method in teaching and truly wants good for you. And somebody who is... Uh, somebody who is suitable for you to follow in terms of their manhaj, in terms of their uh, conduct, in terms of their worship. You find a teacher like that, you cling on to that teacher and you ask that teacher, what book should I study first? He'll tell you. And then what to do next? Okay, uh, you want to study extra? Okay, what book should I read? You, you ask him and so on. So you always go back, as Allah says, ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Now, Allah Alam. Thank you.
Class. Uh, if there's no other questions, then like I said, I'm gonna test you guys. Uh, anyone tries to leave now, I'm gonna stop them. Uh, some people already left for class. Right. Who can mention to me one ayah regarding the virtue of seeking knowledge? If you're written, you can look at your notes. That's not a problem. Iqra. Bismi Rabbi Kaleel Khadr. Ahsant. Anything else? Inna ma yakhsha Allah min ibadi ulama. Those that truly fear Allah, the ulama. Who can mention the ayah that came with uh, the, the ayah that came with that? Because we did, a, you know, we connected it to other ayat. No, 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 before that, before that. Surah Bayyana, yeah. Two parts. The best of people. Yeah, so in one, in one ayah. وَلَكُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَةِ The best of people. And later on, ذَلِكَ مَا خَشْيَ رَبْ The other ayah was, what did you say? Okay, a hadith. Who can mention some hadith? Who can mention some hadith? Who can mention some hadith? Whoever Allah wants good for, He will give an understanding of the religion. Any others? Somebody else, somebody else. Whoever tries to find the path of seeking knowledge, Allah will make his path to Jannah easy for him. And then there was also the hadith of Abu Darda, which is quite uh, long. Okay. Who can mention some statements of the ulama? I can't remember who said it. Uh, it was um, enough to show the, ben uh, the high status of knowledge is that everyone claims it. And enough to show the loneliness of ignorance is that everyone distances it. Ali enough to show the status of knowledge that everyone claims to have it, even if they don't, and enough to show this praiseworthiness of uh, ignorance, is that everyone who is ignorant claims to be free from it. And then we mentioned a statement of Imam Shafi'i, that the best action after the obligatory actions is seeking knowledge, and also the statement of Imam Nawi where he says that groups of the Salaf have agreed that the best, uh, that busying yourself with knowledge is better than the nawafil of Salah, f uh, fasting and so on. Also the scholars are the Ahsan, that was part of the hadith of Abu Darda, the long hadith, that the scholars are the inheritors of the uh, prophets. Um, who can maybe mention one or two incidents, stories of uh, or some of the, the ulama? Very fine, the hadith. Shu'ba radiallahu anhu, when he, uh, rahimahullah, when he uh, traveled to all these different places to verify the hadith. Anything else? So Ibn Rajim Rahimallah. That was regarding that was later, that was regarding the objective of knowledge. We will get to that later. But regarding this regarding seeking knowledge first. Any ulama on the deathbeds? Anyone remember? Huh? Um, what you said from the from the when he basically born Okay, yeah. So Imam Ahmed at the end when he was asked about seeking knowledge, he said from the input to the grave eye his whole life. Ibn uh, Malik when he memorized five lines of poetry on his deathbed. Okay, excellent. So that was regarding virtues of knowledge. Uh, we quickly touched upon the path of knowledge. And uh, lastly, who can summarize the objective of knowledge? It's to um, get um, fear Allah. To fear Allah, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and that's what we call beneficial knowledge. If you're just memorizing and it's not having an effect and you're still falling into sins and uh, it's not had an effect on your ibadah, uh, then that, you know, uh, essentially is not beneficial uh, knowledge. For any uh, anyone who wants any other, you know, a good book to read stories of the ulama and how they used to seek knowledge, how they would travel, how they would uh, uh, read one book seven hundred times. Some ulama read Bukhari seven hundred times, and so on. What's happened here? No. Um, uh, this, this is a good book. It's called Al Mushawwiq Il Al Qiraati Wa Talib Al Ilm, the motivator. Uh, or something which makes you desire uh, seeking knowledge and reading. It's by Shaykh Ali al Imran, who is the one who supervises you know, the publications of uh, Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah's books. Uh, it's written by him and he's mentioned a lot of stories. It's a very good book. And I've, I've gone through this as well uh, as a summary for anyone who wants to. Um, so anyone who doesn't know English, uh, Arabic, and just wants to listen to it in English. Um, okay, I'm just going to finish off, inshallah, as a small little gift for everybody. There's an article uh, that I've written. Basic summarizing today's lecture. Um, everyone, uh, feel free to take a uh, copy 
uh, for yourself and if you want to take any for your family then no problem but just wait until everyone else has taken uh, one first um wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdika la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa فلا تكن عاجلا بالأمر تطلوبه فليس يحماد قبل النضج بحران كفى من العيش ما قد سد من عاوز ففيه للحر إن حققت غنيان